Thanks very much, Miles, and good morning, everyone. Uh, we're very honoured to have uh, our esteemed guests with us here this morning. So, uh, some quick introductions. Uh, first is our founder and CEO, Saeed Amidi, um, who leads uh, Plug and Play, uh, the largest open innovation platform in the world, connecting startups, corporations, investors, um, all to advance social and economic prosperity. He's a general partner in um, Amitzad with nearly 20 years of investment experience in technologies and with exits such as PayPal, Danger, Dropbox and Lending Club. Uh, serial entrepreneur and thought leader in open innovation and uh, has a singular passion for inspiring and helping entrepreneurs succeed. Uh, good morning, Saeed. Great to have you with us this morning. Morning. I'm having difficulty connecting with the video again. But uh, no worries, we'll, uh, we'll bring you up. I got it. I got it. Thanks. There we go. Um, fantastic. I'll go over to Michael. Uh, Michael Olmsted is the Chief Revenue Officer of Plug and Play. Uh, he leads sales, corporate partnerships globally, uh, as well as marketing and new products and services development. Um, in 2013, he was an integral part of founding the Brand and Retail Program, which was the first uh, industry specific accelerator model, which we've scaled across the world, indeed. Uh, he's been a key player in the company's growth and launching our first offices in Paris, Munich and Amsterdam. And prior to Plug and Play was VP of Marketing at Zuli, which was acquired by Google. Uh, great to have you with us, Michael. Great to be here. And finally, our, our, our guest speaker, um, Rob French, uh, served as the Chief Technology Officer of Cushman and Wakefield since May 2014. Uh, he leads a team of 250 IT professionals across 60 countries focused on delivering best-in-class global solutions for clients and colleagues. And before Cushman and Wakefield, he served as VP of Aon's Global Unified Communications and Collaboration Tower, and before that as Vice President of Enterprise Architecture at Bank of America. Uh, Rob, terrific to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. No worries. Um, quick housekeeping, we're going to have a Q&A as, uh, as Miles mentioned. So there's a little Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. Um, so if you click that, ask your questions and we'll do our best to get to that during the Q&A period. Um, if you have any technical issues or other questions, please use the chat box and we've got our folks monitoring that. So without further ado, uh, gents, I'll uh, turn it over to you and, uh, and, um, and Saeed. Um, the floor is yours. Great. Go ahead, please, Mike. Yeah, so I think to kick it off um, and to give context for everyone, I just wanted to kind of explain how our partnership with Cushman really started. Um, known for our you know, global innovation platform and running programs that are specific to certain industries and then bringing together the corporations that make up the value chain in that industry to really come together and work on what the future of that industry might look like from a technology perspective. And you know, looking at the verticals we were operating in in 2018, there was this glaring hole where we had no activity really in real estate and construction, which was funny because um, looking at Saeed's background and history, he is uh, truly a real estate guy. And so we decided that it was probably great timing to you know, launch a program in this space. Uh, the sheer opportunity makes sense, obviously, just from an asset class perspective, the fact that it's such an underserved industry from a technology perspective in terms of industry spend. There was just a lot of reasons we needed to go into this space. And just around that time, we actually got an inbound email um, from your guys, uh, you know, Chief Digital of the Americas, I think Melanie at the time. She reached out and we had a call and literally a month later, Cushman came on as our founding partner for the real estate and construction vertical alongside Prologis and a couple of others. And uh, between that time and now, we've built uh, you know, an amazing relationship specifically um, with you and, and with Adam. And I had the fortune of actually going to LA in September and presenting at the Cushman Symposium to hundreds of your executives about what's next in prop tech. We actually got to debut a few of our startups, but it's collaborations like these and all of the activity you guys have been doing with our startups that really makes you such a great partner. So I really just wanted to set the tone there and just say thank you for being a great partner. Thank you, you know, for going on this journey with us and uh, we look forward to seeing what else we can do. Thank you so much, Mike, uh, and uh, great having you with us, Rob. I must say this uh, is not my 
usual way of meeting people or having discussion. But this past 40 days, it's been the only way. Right. This has become the new normal, uh, at least in, in my world as well. So first time doing one of these uh, virtual firesides, but uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of them uh, as we move forward. Wonderful. And Rob, I know everyone knows uh, Cushman, but they might not know the different sections or different divisions that you guys run. Quite frankly, when we started working together, I was surprised how big is your real estate division where you manage uh, campuses for some of the most major corporations in the world. So I would love that if you share with us very high level what Cushman does and what are the major divisions of it. Sure. So I think a lot of us, when we look at Cushman and Wakefield, we're recognized for our our transactional business, which is our brokerage and helping um, clients find space and, and uh, help them with their lease administration. Um, that's by far our, our most notable area. But I think when you look at our other lines of service, we really focus on helping landlords and occupiers uh, manage their space. Uh, we have a very large portfolio of, uh, of clients that uh, rely on Cushman and Wakefield to um, do everything from uh, managing their critical systems within their buildings to ensuring that janitorial services uh, and engineering services are taken care of on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we actually have quite a large um, critical workforce, uh, or central workforce that's been helping keep the lights on while we're in this COVID situation where a lot of these office buildings are empty, um, but we still need to, have, to, to ensure that uh, everything is safe and working and functioning. And, and that's what our folks in the field are, have been doing for the last 40 days. And that's been um, as critical as ever to make sure that we, uh, we don't disrupt that. So, um, so we're all playing our part uh, and Cushman and Wakefield has been, um, at least in the, in the recent weeks, a real leader both uh, from a thought leadership perspective on um, now that we're in this situation of, uh, of lockdown, how do we start to think about reopening our buildings? And our CEO, Brett White, has been uh, all over um, the media really talking about how Cushman's helping um, clients think about how, how do we get back to the workplace? Uh, so um, my focus over the last few months has been uh, how do we remain productive? How do we keep connected? How do we ensure that uh, our the disruption to our critical service lines has been minimized, and uh, that's been um, an interesting, an interesting few few weeks here uh, of keeping everyone uh, productive and connected. Wonderful. You know, if I can uh, go back to your past, you have always been involved with new technology, new innovation. Uh, I would love to know, like you and your team, what have you done in the last two years, which uh, quite frankly has enabled not only your team, but to Cushman uh, Global Footprint to function with this uh, crazy uh, times that we are living in. Can you share some of the work you have done in the past? Sure. Yeah, I think uh, just going back to um, how Cushman and Wakefield grew up, um, we, we really came together over the last, I would say three years now, um, through major acquisitions. So um, the company I started out with was called DTZ or DTZ, which is the London-based brokerage. Um, we went private and then quickly went on a, a, an M&A journey, which brought together three real powerful players within the, uh, within the industry. Um, we very quickly um, acquired Cassidy Turley, which was a brokerage uh, primarily based in the US. Uh, and then within six months of that, uh, acquired Cushman and Wakefield and then adopted that name and brand uh, just due to its recognition globally. And, uh, and, and, and took a, a company that was around 
billion in revenue and have turned it now into an 8.2 billion in revenue uh, a global um, player in commercial real estate competing with the likes of CBRE and JLL um, who, who are the other two big uh, names in the industry. So um, throughout that journey of bringing these three large uh, companies together, we, we had a strategy which was really focused on a cloud first mentality. Uh, we, we looked at all the services that ran our operations, ran our businesses, um, took the best in, in class, went forward with those, but also had a very large portion of our, of our technology that was built in a greenfield uh, uh, methodology. And uh, that was driven by cloud first. So when we looked at our most critical systems like our CRM, our productivity stack and our, and our collaboration stack, as well as our, our financials and human capital management platforms. Um, we wanted to make sure that those were always available, always connectable. And uh, we chose big players such as Salesforce for our CRM and uh, Workday for financials and HCM and uh, Office 365 through Microsoft uh, as that fabric that uh, connected everyone. So once we knew where we wanted to have our most critical workloads, we, we had to figure out how do we make sure that we can stay connected to all this. Uh, our network, when I came in at the time, you know, one of the things I remember hearing every day uh, in the early days was, well, I get better connectivity in a Starbucks or at home and, uh, you know, I can't, I can't actually be as productive in the office. And so we set out about to fix that and, and uh, rebuilt our entire global, global network using software-defined networking and uh, partnered very closely with uh, Silver Peak and Zscaler uh, to build that. Uh, they remain great partners and uh, have helped us throughout this, this COVID situation um, greatly because it just allows folks to be able to connect to all these platforms from anywhere in the world, anywhere from your house to the Starbucks to the office um, without really having any kind of difference of experience. So it's, it's, it's those things, that foundation has really put us in a great position to keep people productive through um, this remote workforce uh, situation that we're in. Wonderful. I'm, uh, I'm sure you guys and all your colleagues are glad you got that project done before this uh, shelter in place. May I ask, like, when we talked earlier, everybody talks about collaboration. Everybody talks about connectivity. But I thought you had a little bit more foresight that you just don't need to collaborate. You need to get people to have a team spirit, work toward one goal, one direction. And that is even harder when we are shelter in place at home. Can you tell me how do you get your team aligned and what tools do you use? Yeah, um, so, so I think everybody is, you know, before the, the uh, crisis and even during it, we're all collaborating. And to me, collaborating is around sharing ideas and sharing content and making sure things are available. Um, but now that we don't have a common base in our offices, even if you're working in a distributed network of offices, um, there's still that, uh, that, that, that ability to coalesce uh, in a conference room or get people together. Um, and so what we first started to notice when people were, were starting the isolation was that we were losing coordination. Um, people were marching in different directions, even though they were talking, chatting, collaborating, we, we saw a lot of folks going off in different directions. So we, we, we tried to implement um, some tactics that helped us stay coordinated and stay aligned on, on where we wanted to go and how we wanted to get there. Um, and, and, and what we found was, yes, the technology um, such as a Zoom or a Teams, which is what Cushman and Wakefield has been using, um, to stay coordinated. Um, those things help, but it's also ensuring that you have um, elements of the human touch. So what we've been doing is promoting a lot of virtual um, happy hours, um, meet and greets, and just staying connected with a broader set of people than just your team or just your peers. 
um, and making sure that uh, you know we're using video and we're using um, our chat functions and um, these tools that can help us coordinate and stay aligned on you know hey I didn't know you were working on that uh, let's let's start a team group together so that we can uh, stay aligned on on how we want to tackle that challenge or or, or that opportunity. Um, so we've been using a lot of teams. We've been using the O365 stack. And now we're starting to look at, um, through workplace analytics and partnering with, again, Microsoft is, who's really killing it right now in the remote workforce, right? How do we start to measure productivity uh, in this remote environment and who's struggling? Um, and that's going to help us really answer a lot of questions as we start to reopen the offices of, who should go back first if, if we look at how we stagger repopulating our offices and making sure that we're not um, recreating a problem? We want to make sure that we're staggering this, but then we want to be smart about it and pick the people that need to be connected physically uh, the most. And, and, and using these technologies um, like workplace analytics, like Teams, is really going to help us measure that and, and make those decisions. Very good. You know, I kind of to go back in a little bit of the history of plug and play. I feel it is good to be smart, hard working, but also it's good to get lucky. So <laughs> by coincident, my office was on University Avenue in Palo Alto. And that is what led into Google coming to my building and PayPal and so on. And then quite frankly, when I moved to a much bigger building in Sunnyvale, I always say I am between Apple and Google, like roughly three miles from Apple and three miles from Google. This is a little bit of a curveball. This is not to do with in technology. But I recall my father telling me in real estate, there is only three things that are important. Location, location, and location. And with this COVID-19, I didn't think I'm going to be in my little office between my kitchen and garage. And that would be my ideal location. Do you think what we have learned from this past 40 days would carry on when and if we all go back to the same office, same world that we used to know in January? What are your thoughts about that? This is a big discussion. And I'm going to say um, there, there's a, there's a um, philosophical split on, on what people are thinking about this, right? There's one, there's one half of our, of our leadership and thought leadership that says, as soon as people go back, they're gonna go right back to the old habits. All this video is gonna be gone. Nobody's gonna care about it anymore. And everything goes uh, back to the way it was. And all these great habits and, the, and, and maybe the bad ones get left behind uh, and we carry on as, as it was. Um, I happen to be in the camp that thinks that uh, we're going to see a new normal when we go back. Um, and there's a few reasons why I think that. Uh, one is, you know, we're, 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 we're promoting, and I think a lot of legislature is going to mandate, um, that you return to work in a staggered fashion. So you're going to be seeing a large part of your workforce that remains remote, maybe in, even until the end of the year. And there's going to be a portion that starts to trickle back in a very, hopefully a very thoughtful way back into the workforce. Um, and so that's gonna necessitate a lot of these best practices and a lot of these habits, um, hopefully the good, the good habits around coordination and collaboration to continue um, through this new normal. Um, Cushman and Wakefield is, is promoting the six foot office. Um, we're thinking about new ways to design floor, floor space to accommodate some social distancing as we repopulate the office and bring more and more folks back into the workplace. But we also think that it's gonna force um, COOs and CFOs to rethink the way that they're using their space, to rethink the way um, that their commercial real estate footprint looks. Uh, and we're here to really help guide that conversation through our expertise and, uh, 
And so, yeah, I do think we're going to see a new normal. I do think that a lot of what we're seeing right now is going to carry on at least for the next 12 months. Um, so, so yeah. Um, uh, but, but again, there's always going to be the school of thought that says, give me back to my corner office and, uh, you know, away I go. So, yeah, you know, I must tell you, like, I used to visit uh, this very large building in Menlo Park that was owned by Sun Microsystem. Oh, I remember. You know, like the whole building had office after office after office. I mean, like there was like rows of offices. And then as you know, Facebook took over that building and mm -hmm. totally opened it up. I'm now wondering if we're gonna go back to single person offices again. And again, I must say, as you can tell, I have a lot of white hair and beard. I like going back to what we had, but I think the new generation, like my uh, work team kept telling me, Saeed, let's work from home. And I must say, I'm so old fashioned. I said, I don't accept that. <laughs> but, and like I fought it, I, I fought it. I, I remember as early as January. So I think there is going to be like a gap between old folks like me and I, I called young people like you. And you told me, Said, I'm not as young as I look. Uh, but <laughs> I, I said that you're dressed uh, without a tie and you know i think there is going to be a difference between the generations how they I'll, I'll tell you one thing we're looking at um and and i think it hits upon your point here is uh, what's going to happen to co-working you know we work really pioneered that and they ran into some some issues before the crisis hit but um you know, every, it, what, it, what it did to our industry was it got everybody talking about, well, co-working, it, it, it's a thing. We think it's going to be here to stay. Um, yes, there were some things that, um, that, that maybe could be do, done better from a business model perspective, but the concept was really solid. People seemed to love it. They loved the concierge services that were offered in these open spaces. They loved the floor plan. They loved the collaboration um, that they thought they were getting from, from having a setup. Um, like that, but now with uh, the social distancing and uh, you know this inability to really um, physically connect, um, what's going to happen to those spaces? Are we going to start slicing them back up into office space? Are we going to start redesigning? And those are the kind of concepts and and um, and, and challenges that uh, that we're set out to try to answer, or at least advise our clients on on, on how to think about that. But but co-working is a space that that we're watching very closely. Rob, I was curious, um, obviously generational um, perspectives will, will play a role, but also the will play a big role as well. Some require that face-to-face -face interaction, some not at all. I'm just wondering when you speak to your clients and their real estate strategies going forward, which industries are skewing towards, yeah, we're going to get back to the office versus, no, nah, this is actually working okay. You know, I think it's pretty obvious the tech sector is going to be one of those that's, you know, we can do our jobs from anywhere, right? I can code on my home uh, laptop just as easily as I can do it in, in, the, uh, in the office. Um, I think, um, you know, if you look at the financial sector, you know, look at companies like JP Morgan, Bank of America, they're going to want to get back um, as quickly as possible. And they're the ones that are actually making big investments and, you um, in technology that's going to help keep people safe. Um, we're, we're also looking at technology um, that can look at proximity of, of who you've come in contact with. Um, but there's all kinds of challenges that we have to navigate as, as we start looking at these things around privacy um, and, and certain um, healthcare rules, right? So we want to be careful. Um, but I do think um, there's going to be certain industries out there like, like the financial services, um, that, that are going to want to get back in. I know uh, uh, there's a large segment of Cushman and Wakefield that um, would like to get back out in front of clients in a more personal way. So, um, uh, you know, there's going to be a split, but I think this is an episode that's going to force us to make a decision on does everyone need um, the same space uh, that we were providing before this um, as, as we look at the new normal. Um, I think there's a whole 
host of, uh, of industries that, that are going to say, well, uh, my call centers, maybe those can be virtual. My, uh, my, my uh, customer relationship, maybe that can be virtual. And, uh, and they're going to stay in the home office. Um, we're gearing up for that ourselves internally. We think we're going to have to provide um, some at-home kits for, for some of our colleagues to help them be as productive as possible. Uh, and those are all things that we're going to be looking at here over the next few months. Well, and it's interesting. Um, I've noticed, you know, a lot of these trends were happening before what's going on right now. And in many yep. ways, this is accelerating those trends. Is that something you're seeing? Absolutely. Um, you know, there's, I can guarantee you there's going to be a segment of the workforce that never steps foot in an office again, right? And, and, and they just, the, the virtual office is their new norm. Uh, I know my wife works for um, uh, a company that's, basically saying they're not going to reopen until um, the next year and they're only going to use their office space for uh, critical meetings where you have to be there um, face to face. Uh, so, so I think it's, I think, I think it's already um, starting to become apparent that we are going to be in a new virtual world. Um, and, and, you know, when Facebook starts to enter into um, the, the, um, the, the conferencing and media stream, right? I think they're placing their bets and it's becoming pretty clear on, uh, on how they see it as well. So um, it's, it's gonna be very interesting to see uh, how this all plays out over the next six months. Yeah, you know, if I can tell you that this morning I had a little uh, event in Houston and you know, it was like a shocking moment for me that the oil and energy industry was 9% of GDP. And the, the keynote speaker said, now with oil prices hovering around $20, $25, now it's only 3% of the GDP. Yeah. And quite frankly, like, it was like, my God, the, the, when you take the top 10 companies in the world, 10 years ago, ExxonMobil was in the top 10, you know, Walmart was in the top 10, but now it's only technology companies. It is really, uh, and then again, I'm just relating that uh, I heard I think it's, it was on the news that Google stepped away from a bunch of new acquisitions in uh, San Jose. And again, I'm saying that if they don't need to house 10 more thousand people in San Jose, I think there is going to be a new way of doing real estate. And uh, again, I... I I, as Mike mentioned, I love real estate. So I, I hope we don't go the way of the oil industry. You know, I don't think, and, and this is just my personal thought, right? Um, but I don't think we're ever going to be in a situation where we don't need space, right? I, 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 it's a fixed commodity, right? So, it, it, you know, there's only so much land out there. And, and I think it's always going to be in demand and I think there's always going to be growth opportunity, but the way that we're using it, um, you know, we've already been looking at the, the evolution of the way that people are using space from when we, when we start talking about self-driving cars, you know, what does that mean to parking lots, right? We all already know that we're going to be looking at certain space in the commercial area uh, is going to transform over time as new technology comes in. Does COVID in the virtual workspace um, fundamentally change that? Um, I think time will tell, but it's absolutely conversations we're having with our clients and, and we're having internally around how do we need to adjust, how do we need to pivot um, to meet what the new demand might look like in a year from now? Um, so yeah, I think those are great questions and certainly things that we wanna answer internally uh, and then help our advise our clients on, on, on what we're seeing. Um, so I do think, you know, we, we knew a year ago that uh, data and uh, commercial real estate data in general was going to be a new um, valuable commodity that Cushman and Wakefield has um, quite a bit of, right? Along with the expertise to help advise. And that was always going to be part of our strategy moving forward. Now, perhaps that gets accelerated. 
Yeah, you know, if I can share with you when I spoke to Mayor Park of Seoul, Korea, mm. I was quite surprised. He has 10 million people. He said his COVID uh, new cases are less than three per day. He was sitting in his city hall building with 17,000 people who were working at City Hall. This was about two weeks ago. And he told me, Said, the world has changed. The new normal, and I thought he was normal because he was in his office, he had 17,000 people in this building. But he said, Said, the new normal will never be what we knew three months ago. And again, I think in the real estate world, in uh, both retail and office, I don't know if residents will change as well, but it's going to be a new world. And I think uh, people will need the Cushman Wakefield to spearhead the transition to this new world. No and question. And, and, technology and, and, and technology, I think. Technology um, and, and, and our, our subject matter expertise uh, is going to play a critical role of redefining what the new normal is as, as we start to learn more and start to see more patterns that we can help. And uh, certainly that's going to be uh, a, a space that we play a really large role in. And, and our CEO has been out there um, talking about ways in which we're already helping folks uh, re-enter the workplace. We've, we've done it in China. Um, they're, they're well ahead of, uh, of where we are here in the West as far as getting back to the office. And we've already played a significant role in helping uh, uh, folks return to, to those workplaces. So uh, I think uh, future planning, uh, helping companies come up with a new real estate strategy that applies these new trends that, that come out of this situation. Because, you know, let's not forget that um, as we start to recover and move back into the office, there's always going to be this um, thought of something like this could reoccur. Or we could see another um, uh, episode next winter um, in, in the West and uh, we have to be prepared for that. So I think there's gonna be a much more heightened awareness um, that these things could reoccur and they could happen. Um, so hopefully we'll be much more prepared on how uh, we're gonna deal with this and, and have strategies in place that um, that don't uh, cause uh, um, such, um, I, I guess, aggressive responses that we saw in this first round. You know, I, I know uh, the head of real estate of Apple and the head of real estate of Google. And I think it will be very interesting if we could get the, your CEO to join a panel with a few of these large corporations that are doing well. You know, like it was funny, I received a text from one of the early Googlers uh, yesterday that he said, you know, this is a good business model. $34 billion revenue the first quarter with $112 billion cash in the bank. The company is doing pretty well, like with over 70 margin, uh, you know, 60, 70 percent margin under uh, ad words or whatever. But I really think it will be great if we could get head of real estate of Google, head of real estate of Apple, Cushman Wakefield on a panel to discuss what is going to happen in the future. And quite frankly, I believe nobody knows, but at least it will be an incredible discussion. And I, I'm sure Mike can set that up. Yeah, of course. What do, you, what do you think? I love to get Rob your point of view and Mike's point of view, because I think that is what people are wanting to know for the future. Let's go with Rob first. Yeah, um, I can never speak for Brett, right? So uh, I think uh, he's he's absolutely out there in the media today, talking to um, you know, uh, talking to our clients and talking to um, 
uh, the media around ways that Cushman and Wakefield could can advise and help. Um, I'll bring that one back, Saya. Uh, that's all I can say. <laughs> hey, 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 I'm not I'm not uh, trying to skip out on this question, but Rob, we have a number of questions in the Q and A box, and and one that keeps coming up. Actually, I'm really curious. You talked about um, measuring uh, new metrics for your at-home employees. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering what kind of metrics are you looking at? Are you looking at duration? They're in your Teams app, response time. How do you measure productivity uh, now that we're in this kind of virtual world? It's interesting. And I could, you know, I'm not going to pull out the first report that I saw, but it was pretty amazing. And I was, uh, I was kind of blown away at how um, some simple metrics that you don't really think about, um, uh, if you look at them over time and you look at them for certain demographics can really tell a story. Okay. And um, what we're looking at is actually all of the things you just said. So how much time are you spending in meetings? Who are you meeting with? How much uh, of your meetings are, are, are client facing? Um, what's your stickiness? With, how often are you talking to those clients? Um, we're looking at a, a lot of uh, data that's really just coming from a couple of key places. We're looking at our CRM. We're looking at our calendars. We're looking at our uh, Teams IM and who you're collaborating with. We're even getting down to how much time do you spend with your manager uh, week to week? Are you getting enough one-on-one -on -one time? Are you getting enough guidance? Um, and um, yeah, so, so those are really key measurements that are starting to tell us who's staying connected, who's staying coordinated through this remote workforce. Um, and, and thriving and, and who's struggling and who's, who, who needs some more support, um, whether that's bringing them back to the office first or maybe even just doing something as simple as giving them more technology so they can stay um, productive in the home. So uh, there's a lot of data that we're getting from Office 365 through from Workday and from uh, our CRM um, that's painting this picture. And um, we're hoping that we can, once, once we, we have our hands around it, we can, we can help clients do the same thing. And I guess just as a follow-up, are you seeing a reduction in those kind of busy meetings? I, I think we've all seen that that meme, you know, yet another meeting that could have been resolved with an email. Are you yes. seeing more kind of concentrated efforts on having productive meetings? So, so one of the metrics we looked at is how many meetings are people, and, and, and the great thing is we can see pre-COVID and post-COVID or during COVID and compare those two. So meetings have gone down, IMs have gone way up, and, uh, and, and channels within our team's environment has gone way up. Yeah. Um, the adoption of that was, you know, let's just call it middling prior to the crisis, and now it's just taken off like wildfire, and we're starting to see people, instead of having meetings, um, they're sorting things out through um, back and forth uh, uh, messaging chains. And uh, so, so we are seeing trends that, that, that kind of support that people are using the tools more than they probably would if they were in the office. So. Something that we've noticed, Saeed and I, at least with our clients, we've got about you know, 375 corporate partners. We've seen an uptick in engagement um, in terms of the number of people from the corporations that we work with participating in events like this versus you know prior uh, to covid where it's just those few champions that fly out and come to our events so we're starting to see increased engagement as well uh, with our clients uh, because of this and it's actually been you know a pleasure to see yeah. you know, we're seeing it as well we host quite a bit of uh, similar uh, meet and greets and uh, webinars that uh, you know we would get good participation prior to this but now we're seeing those in in the tens of thousands uh, joining some of our uh, our conferences and uh, you know if you look at um, some of our online media we're seeing um, I think last week our six foot office um, video had close to a million views um, on YouTube and, and and those are numbers that I would have just never expected and uh, you know they're rivaling some of my kids Fortnite videos that they watch right so <laughs> yeah <laughs> time and maybe you can uh, ask some of the questions from the audience. We cannot hear you yet. Okay. This is still the challenge. Right? Success, the successfully challenge. muted myself. So uh, Are you getting challenges with um, this. Yeah, we're we're all we're all learning. Um, uh, just on the metric on the metrics question, um, building on that, um, uh, there were some questions around information on human behavior, you know, maybe some of those you know, soft factors around um, how are you measuring people's wellness, their product, their actual like effectiveness in what they're doing. Um, 
uh, I think there's a background here around um, focus on smart buildings, building management systems, and, and how is that sort of shifting uh, within this sort of new new normal with both remote work and, uh, and office work? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to, it's always going to be hard to measure what people, how people are feeling, right? I mean, that's, that's um, very subjective and, um, and difficult without, without, you know, how do you ensure that you're not treading on too much personal space uh, and, and forming a big brother uh, type relationship with your, with your um, colleagues. Um, so, so we're trying to figure that out. We've got some ideas on, especially as people start to go back to the office, making sure at least from a symptomatic perspective that people feel healthy as they're coming back into the office and we're promoting people, you know, if you don't feel well, stay at home, right? Um, we're not trying to force people to feel like they have to come back when we start to reopen. And then that's been something that we've been very strong in our, in our uh, messaging to our colleagues is that, you know, mm -hmm. we're not going to pressure anyone. Um, and so the, the, the whole conversation around smart buildings is, is an interesting one, right? Um, sensors and where do you put them and how do you start to make sense of this data? We've been working on, on these concepts for the last two years and now mm. the interest in that has, has taken off, but we're also looking at, you know, what are some low, um, low cost points of entry where we can still start to get uh, tracking data and uh, you know proximity mm -hmm. data without having to put sensors everywhere in a building or have all these things connected to your Wi-Fi. Um, so we are working with technology that that promotes that, and there's partners that um, are coming to us, and we're coming to them on how can we maybe start to uh, help help our customers um, do the same thing. So um, a lot of great ideas are coming out of this uh, this this. Crisis, right? Uh, I think a lot of innovation. Um, we're trying to figure out what what makes sense, what feels a little too, mm. you know, maybe maybe um, uh, uh, too big brother impressive, right? Uh, or intrusive, maybe yeah. is a better word. Um, and and strike that balance between uh, making mm. sure our colleagues feel like we have concern and we care without getting too um, right. Too so so yeah. It's all good stuff. So there was a, a bunch of really interesting questions around, you know, the specific uh, technologies that uh, and the steps that you guys are seeing from your clients. Uh, noticed that on your website recently, there's a really nice sort of playbook, you know, do these things. Um, uh, you know, and in our conversation uh, with Mayor Park, you know, they were talking about thermal imaging scanners and, you know, the ability to do contract tracing. Um, and so um, there's a question here around like, what are the key sort of questions you're getting uh, from your clients that um, maybe beyond the obvious things to think be thinking about and which technologies are you seeing as most valuable that um, people should be thinking about, thinking about investing in um, and utilizing um, as we consider a return to work? I think as people start going back to the, the office, the most important thing that we should be doing is, is, is giving people a psychological feeling that they're safe. I think just, mm. just that is the goal. And if we look at technologies that can promote um, that sense mm. of well-being as you're walking back to the office and leaving your house, maybe, you know, to go to the office for the first time in two, three months, um, how, do you, how do you make sure that people feel safe? Um, and technology that promotes that wellness is, is really what we're looking at. Um, you know, if you look at our six-foot office, the technology that we're actually trying to, to promote is just printouts and signage and, and, and things that can help people um, stay in a coordinated path so that you're not coming within too close of contact. We're doing new floor plans that um, help people mm. figure out, all right, how do you correctly space colleagues as they return to the office and they're not um, positioning themselves too close to one another. So, so some of the things are really simple and, and, and we are looking at technology that uses smartphones and Bluetooth um, to track whether or not people have come into contact with one another. And mm -hmm. if you have come in contact with someone who has later or, or um, um, later per, uh, said that they have symptoms, um, letting people know that they've come in contact with people who may have been symptomatic without getting down to the individual level. Um, mm. And so that's, those are things that I think are going to be useful um, as we try to promote, promote this sense of well-being as people come back. Fantastic. Um, just transitioning here, you know, we've spoken a lot about the, um, the economic impact on the industry. We've spoken about some of those key practices. Um, 
Uh, but a lot of our uh, attendees here, you know, we're all in the innovation space, very much into collaborating with startups to, to push the envelope. Could you talk a little bit about, uh, and maybe this would be a great one to, to get Michael and, uh, and Saeed's perspectives on, but how do you see the current moment impacting uh, the, the startup activity, the, par- the startup partnership activity, um, perhaps right in the short term and, and maybe in uh, looking out in the next year or, or so? Uh, with respect to, um, you know, just move back to the office and these new norms that we've got to sort of create around work. Yeah, I, I don't want to speculate too much, but I think that, like, like I was saying earlier, that there's a lot of great ideas coming out of this and how you can promote the get back to work safely, um, uh, psychological feeling and that feeling of well-being. And I think mm. those are going to be areas that all companies are going to be looking to invest in. Here in the next few months and, and so that's going to be a big uptick um, you know I'll, I'll, I'll let Michael and, and Syed talk about um, some of the other the startups and, and, and what they may be facing here in the next uh, few months well what I'm seeing at least um, from our partners from the partner perspective is a shift in kind of strategy so they're looking at more uh, remote tools things that they're you know employees can use versus you know technology that might affect their core business so maybe a shift in what they're looking for from the fundraising perspective the startup side obviously a decrease right De- especially depending on the industry i think you're seeing some industries health startups success but um, from the vcs that i've talked to they're really looking at doubling down on their existing portfolio companies versus net new investments so taking advantage of pro rata opportunities and funding companies they've already got an equity interest in versus going out and finding new uh, investments. That being said, when things like this happen, there's always emerging amazing solutions that could be the new way of doing things. The new retail, the new retail formats as an example, because you see department stores are obviously going to be struggling quite a bit. So we're on the lookout for those amazing next unicorn potential opportunities. But you know, startups are having a tough time, just like, you know, most companies in this climate. Anybody? One thing I've seen, you know, it's really hard to get a webcam these days, right? Um, they're all on back order. So I, I, I personally, I think there's going to be some innovative uh, uh, camera technology that comes out of all this that you're going to see applied to a whole bunch of different mm-hmm. uh, applications as it, as it comes out. But I, I, one of the things that I'm watching personally, their side hustle. If I can tell you, you know, I believe uh, like we have a lot of uh, technologies to that delivered ad to the right person at the right time. Like uh, we have a company called Kiana that as you're walking in front of a boutique, they would deliver you an ad, please come in for a glass of champagne. Uh, Quite frankly, that same technology can be used for distancing and the same technology can be used for delivering warning. You're too close to your body, you know, just keep the distance at the office. So I think for the relevant technology and startups, it is an incredible opportunity. But in general, as Mike said, I think all our VC partners says you have to save as much cash as you could. You have to have a longer runways. And I am even in the B2B businesses, I think people will not uh, buy software as much as before, at least for six months to a year. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely necessary. Yeah, you are starting to see though some startups, you know, shifting their use case and repurposing their technology for the current times. Uh, One of our startups was doing mapping for identifying earthquakes, and now they're using it for potentially uh, contact tracing, you know, using a similar Mm. technology, different use case. Um, So you're going to see some of that. I mean, you saw earnings from the big public companies. Um, You know, some of them are doing very well, the technology companies. Uh, but there's going to be other industries that are going to be very, very hurt. I mean, you look at apparel, you look at retail overall, um, some of our clients are getting hammered. And, you know, what's going to come out of that? I think you're going to see some that, that make it through these times, some that don't. But there's going to be some amazing startups that emerge. 
Wonderful. Mm. Rob, I wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank Cushman, Wakefield, all your team members. Quite frankly, the way we work with our startups and corporations is that we try to navigate the innovation journey. And I, I really think the collaborative of working with other corporations, with startups, with the teams, it's going to help us go through this faster. Any closing remarks? It's great having you, but I love that if you do some closing remarks. And uh, again, thank you for joining us. Oh, it was my pleasure. And uh, I was just looking through the, the question stream. There's some great stuff there that we didn't touch on. So uh, if you ever invite me back. Pick one and tell us, pick your favorite and tell us the answer. Oh, boy. Okay. Now I put myself in. <laughs> and Rob, you can go through and uh, do those separately also. I've been answering. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, as opposed to picking my favorite, I'll just say uh, there's a lot of savvy folks on this call that know quite a bit about our industry. And uh, it just goes to show how pervasive real estate is in everybody's lives. So um, thank you for listening. And I appreciate the feedback. So stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks, Great, Rob. Rob. Thanks. Fantastic, Thanks. Fantastic, everyone. Thank you, team. Thank you. So Fantastic, everyone. And, uh, and, and look, you know, there, there were so many topics that we, we didn't get to touch on, but we will put a blog together um, uh, noting some of the best um, points that came out of this conference, and we can also uh, touch on some of those other topics. So thanks for everyone. I'm going to hand it back to, to Miles to land the plane this morning, uh, but great to, great to be with you all. Thank you all.